I'll be talking to you. I'll be sharing, if you will, something that we think is increasingly important. And it's really a chance for us to share some of the work that we've been doing for the last 18 months. And we've titled it The Architecture of Strategy and Transformation. Does anybody know what that means? Anyone want to have a wild guess? You know, what, the, what do we mean by the architecture of strategy and transformation? We've, uh, we've tested this phrase, and most of them you know, go politely like this. You know, what are you talking about? But I think this is something that's incredibly important, and I think that's something that we, you know, as leaders, executives, innovators, especially maybe the innovation managers, need to get a grasp on. This is how we very often see the world. Over the last couple of years, we've been working extensively with top management and board of directors. There's something that's happening around that table. And with all due respect, there's something that we call it the pull of the past or the suck of the present, but it somehow makes the board of director or the top management decision-making body kind of revert back to the old business that we know. And we keep coming back to the legacy business that we call it. And then there's a discussion, like, I want to see the financials, like you mentioned, Rob, the IRRs. And ideally, I want to see the financials within you know, two or three years. And, and we need to analyze this in depth, although intellectually, we know it'll be all guesses. And if we bring it back to Norway, you know, this is what most companies, almost regardless of where you are in the value chain, kind of see the world right now. You know, we have a legacy of fish, and we used to be a fishing nation, fishing village, really. We've gone through various technology stage, stages of oil and gas, and we will continue to be a you know, great oil and gas nation for decades to come. But there's still a tendency, you know, the oil gas, sorry, the oil price, we go up and we're happy, it goes down and we cry, and we couldn't even imagine a scenario below 70 or 60 or 50 or what the fuck, 46 this morning? We need to cut cost. It is the base reflex built into anybody with an economics or business degree. Now, this is kind of problematic because it means that we keep preserving the legacy core business as opposed to building in transformational capacity. How many of you have in your company a, trans a deep transformational capacity? Or you have a CEO that knows what it means? One, two, good, you're the CEO. Three, you're almost a CEO. This isn't something that we teach. I've been teaching strategy at the business school for 12 and a half years now. This is still to this day not something that we teach. Even ex executive levels, it's not really something that we teach. So you guys, you come here and we learn. Solution, step number one, escape dominant logic. Challenge which business are we in? And with all due respect to Statel, if you look at Statel as an oil and gas company, yes, you are. But if you look at it as an innovation and technology powerhouse, like Lisa, it gives you a different path into the future. And the second, and this is very important, is designing a structure. Designing a structure for transformation. Now, I'll, talk you three, I'll take you to three levels and sort of go into what do we mean by that. So the first one we need to understand is that there are three kinds of innovation. Innovation number one, efficiency-based innovation. Efficiency we need to cut cost. We need to do more with the same capital. Ideally, we preserve capital, we save, and we pay out larger dividends. Very often, this ends up with being a lean process, which can be good. It's a downsizing process, which can be good. But what usually happens is we keep as is, and we fine tune it a little bit. Now, this can be important, but if this is Everything that you do, you might be risking too much. Then you have the performance improving innovation. And most of you probably have an iPhone. You know, I got this one. It's about the size of my car. But this is not really that innovative. It is simply a fantastic upgrade to an existing body of iPhones. And it's a perfect example of the performance improving. Now, we have a few people here from Nodan. What Nodan is doing in collaboration with Lisa is a very interesting example of performance improving innovation where they make the doors and the windows intelligent, internet enabled. 
What's really interesting is this. What's really challenging is this. What's really difficult for most companies to handle is this. And we call it market creating innovations. This is entirely new. It's entirely new customers. It's entirely new business models. It is very expensive. And the CEO usually will hate it because he doesn't know how to evaluate it, doesn't know how to calculate it. But this is really, and there's a lot of research coming out now from a shareholder value perspective, that this is really where most innovation value is created. Examples, Shackleton, we'll hear about that later. Subtech, and also, in, interestingly enough, I think a lot of the work that's been done by Lisa Fieber has been market creating innovation because you've created a whole new set of customers. But this is not something that we handle well on a company level. Most executives understand the efficiency perspective. Most executives like to think about the upgrade perspectives, but very few are able to grasp and really, really understand what do we mean by the market creating innovations. And there's a reason for it. There's a good reason for it. And we need to look at the leadership development mentality of what Ibarra calls what leaders actually do with their time. Four categories. Category number one, leaders are doers. They are extremely busy executives with tons of stuff to do, tons of meetings to attend, and an email list to reply that they only get through Sunday night. They are extremely efficient and by default also very busy, but they get things done. The second category is the mobilizer. This is the pump your troops. This is the Motivate your troops. And Stian, I suspect you might be sort of doing really well in this category of mobilizing the people around you. Now, these two types of leadership skills, very important, and that's also where most leaders have their focus. And we have this. The leader as a strategizer, working with inside-outside forces, develop a long-term, short-term strategy. Now, interestingly, Ibarra's research says that most leaders know this is important, and they also know they're not doing enough of it. But they live with that bad conscience because they're really busy. This one's the black box. This is the missing piece. Ibarra's research from INSEAD says that very few executives know that they even should be looking at this, as in, how do you build an organizational architecture that allows for the things that you want to do? How do you build the mechanisms, the structures, the bodies? And I think, Rob, you talked about, a lot about this in, in your talk. How do you build those organizational entities that allows this to happen outside of your own time and place? It's something that in Ibarra's research, most executives are, with all due respect, totally blind to. They might do it by chance. They might do it by random. But as a structured process, it's not that advanced. Now, to look at the, the last piece of this puzzle is really how do you make innovation happen? Now, a lot of the focus on innovation has been about ideation. We need lots of good ideas. We need a lot of business model thinking. We need a lot about product upgrades. We need a lot of, well, Rita McGrath, Columbia professor, and she's also on our advisory board of, of global advisors that we work with, says the problem is not the ideas. In her research, she says, you know, a good-sized organization, maybe the size of DM, DSM or Statoil, they have about 3,000 ideas to every one that makes it to market. What she says is the problem is the system, the processes, the methods, the tool. It is the resource allocation process within the structures that kills the ideas as they move down the pipeline. It's what we call the how of the organization which most executives are very often blind to. So we need to develop this innovation proficiency. Three stages, ideas and discovery, incubation, acceleration. Some companies have this. DSM might be one of the best ones that we know of. Most companies that we've worked with over the last couple of years are, <coughs> let's call them early starters on this. Amazon. Amazon runs more than 2,000 business model experiments a year. They have an extremely structured process of doing it. They have a learning cycle for doing it often and quickly with a very clear mandate to fail. Jeff Bezos openly, internally and externally says that we need to plant seeds today. 
that takes us at least seven years. Five years, seven years, ten years, that's fine. And this is important, and he says this at the various investor meetings, that if we needed a payback time on two or three years, most of the things that makes up Amazon today would never have happened. I'm not going to point fingers, but Jim and Erica, we attended a meeting two days back where some very, very intelligent people said that unless you can prove value in two years, we can't even talk to you. But it was a nice set of people. Enough with the chat. Now it's your turn. So we've been looking at this. We've been working on this now for um, about 18 months. We've been meeting with boards. We've been meeting with top leaders. We've been interviewing people. And we've been sort of trying to sort of, how do we make this totally understandable on a super simple level? How do you make this obvious? Well, obvious number one is to move from a singular logic, we have one idea, to a system logic where you have a process in place. So we went reading and researching. How many of you have you know, had the pleasure of reading this one? It's from 1970. It is a Harvard classic by Joseph Bauer. And it keeps coming up in the innovation liter literature today as one of the most important books that you should read. And it's super hard. More recently, it's the, from resource allocation to strategy. And these books are really filling out a significant piece of the puzzle of how do you make this innovation process happen? We looked into go corporate governance from the board, CEO, top management. And we tried to piece all of these different pieces together. And we came up with a magic formula. And this is as simple as we could make it so far. And it's really simple. It's M plus S plus M. It's what we call an architecture, an architectural formula. It's money, it's structure, and it's a mandate. Money, two questions. We have easy access to minor investments funds. Number two, we are truly great at making explorative investments. So the questions are easy, the answers perhaps not so much. Second, structure. We have a unit that could be a person, a department, or a huge division in place to sort of handle these entirely new business developments models and entirely new business development. I think, Lee, you you know, you're sort of staffing up that structure. And there's a party of two, five, eight. eight. All right, you're growing. Excellent, excellent. And we also have a corporate structure in place for the spin-ins, the spin-out, the early venturing. And finally, and this is incredibly important, and this perhaps was the biggest puzzle for us to solve. This was a missing piece that we struggled with for a while. The mandate. What is the mandate that you work with? Because you can't have the money and you can have the structure, but unless you have the explicit mandate, it's not gonna do much good. We have an explicit growth ambition from the board of directors, top management. We have a license to think big, dream big, and take calculated strategic risks. We think on a deep level that this is building blocks. It's the formula from moving from a legacy core to a transformational capacity.